In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. So once again, good morning to all. We continue to bask in the glow and the celebration of Christmas on this first Sunday following Christmas. And uh, today I'd like to consider a topic of, since we, we considered in the Christmas Gospels, um, God made man in Jesus, the, the, that Jesus is declared to be Savior, Messiah, and Lord, and Son of God in the Christmas Gospels. And uh, now we have a new proclamation of the sonship, sonship forgive me, of Jesus. So I'd like to kind of explore, um, say, the first hundred years of Christianity, if you'll, if you'll bear with me. And uh, you guys know by now I really can't help myself, so, uh, so let's do that this morning. You see, for St. Paul, the earliest writings about the sonship of Jesus, we find in uh, Romans, first chapter, verse 4. And, and Paul's understanding of the sonship of Jesus went like this, that he is uh, of the house and family of David according to the flesh, made son of God through his resurrection in the Holy Spirit. So for Paul, in those first early days of Christianity, Paul's understanding is that Jesus becomes son of God in his resurrection, the firstborn of the new creation. And... Uh, so not long after we have the Gospel of Mark. So when is the, the, the moment of sonship, if you will, in Mark's Gospel? And Mark's Gospel doesn't uh, contain any infancy narratives, any reference to the early life of Jesus. So when then in Mark's Gospel is the moment of sonship? And we find that in the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan by John. When Jesus comes up out of the water and the heavens open and the Father declares to Jesus... You are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And so we have a movement backwards, if you will, from Paul's time, the uh, sonship in the resurrection, to sonship in, in Jesus' baptism in Mark's gospel. Well, by the time Luke and Matthew, by the time those gospels are written, communities that Christians are speaking to, uh, which have a, a heavy Jewish concentration, the, the Jewish community is asking, what is the relationship of Jesus to the house of David? And what is Jesus, uh, in terms, how does Jesus fulfill the prophecy that the Messiah is supposed to be born in Bethlehem? And so Luke and Matthew, in their day and in their style, frame the, the moment of sonship by Jesus' birth in Bethlehem and that in a dream, in each case, um, in Joseph's case, he, is, he, is become, he becomes aware of that God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in the Annunciation in Luke, Mary becomes um, aware of the fact that she will be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, and thus the child born will be the Son of God. So there you go. So we go from resurrection to baptism to the birth in Bethlehem, that's the moment of sonship uh, in, in the Gospels. But now we come to John's Gospel. And by now, Christianity is fully engaged in, the, in speaking with, particularly the Jewish communities in Alexandria and Antioch. These are very learned people. They are steeped in the wisdom and study of Greek philosophy. And uh, according to Aristotle and Plato and so forth, and according to those philosophies, um, there is a divine mind, and so, and it's called nous, N-O-U-S. So nous is the divine mind that, that is in the, uh, uh, in the beginning there is nous. And the expression of this divine mind, the expression of the divine mind is logos, which means the word. And it is through the logos that nous begins to bring and form all things in the universe and in reality and sustain them in their being. I know, it's a spacey concept. But let's apply this application of Greek philosophy with a Christian understanding of who Jesus is. And so now it begins to make more sense to us. In the beginning was the Word, was this Logos, and the word was with God, and the word was God. As my speech is to my thought, so 
and Logos is to Nous. So Jesus is to God, the Father, creator of all things. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. So God is ordering all of reality. In the beginning, through the word, the moment of sonship has moved backwards from Bethlehem to the very beginning of time. And so the Genesis begins in the beginning and John's gospel in the beginning, uh, the same words are found here. And so in this act of creation through our Lord Jesus Christ, all things have their being. Uh, that, that expression that we use, in him we live and move and have our being. So that's as spacey as we're going to get this morning. But I just wanted to point out that this moment of sonship appears to be moving backwards in time um, in, in the church's awareness and the community's awareness of who Jesus was. And so it's all of those realities that we celebrate today. Now, what might this mean? That Let's come back to how the Logos or how the Word, how Jesus orders and sustains all of creation in their being. That is to say that our God is a God of relationship. That the enemy of relationship is chaos. In a chaotic world, nothing's in relationship. Anything could happen at any moment. That no relationships exist between any particle of reality and any other. It's total chaos. So chaos is the enemy, is the enemy of logos. Chaos is an, a completely non-comprehensible reality. And, um, and so we as the Christian community are children of the word, that we are children of relationship, that we are people who bring God's communion, God's acknowledgement that all things that are real in this world are connected, are connection. And so each day then becomes, begins with the challenge, how and in which way am I connected to all other humans, first of all? How am I connected and how am I living out my connection with all human beings? How am I living out my connection with this beautiful earth that God has given us? How am I living out my connected always through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit with God's reality himself? How do I practice and live out my communion every single day? We've been through quite a year, haven't we? And when, when we first experienced this reality of coronavirus, the first thing that we did is we had to separate. We had to come out of relationship with our usual activities and our usual daily connections. People went to work from home. We, we experienced apartness. And, and we seemed to be out of relationship. People really suffered. They got depressed. There was an increase in mental illness. Um, we experienced a false connection in the sense of people say, let's pretend that this virus doesn't exist and we'll continue to live our lives as if it's not here. Well, we all know how that worked out, that if we live as if we're out of connection and, and we're not in relationship with reality, then we can impact each other negatively. You know, that um, some, some folks said, well, this wearing of a mask is an infringement upon me, um, upon my rights to do uh, and make individual decisions, whether I believe in it or not, I, I should be able to wear a mask or not. And that impacted people. Um, a lot of people got sick. So when we pretend we're not in relationship, when we're not in this holy communion with one another, this amounts to self-deception. And it brings evil, great evil, and suffering to our world. When we, when we pretend that we're not in, re in relationship with God's earth, we can amass and create great wealth, but we poison our rivers. We can't, and our air. Um, when we pretend we're out of relationship with our earth, we can extract great quantities of coal or oil or gas and then um, and spend all that wealth that that gives us, but leave behind great ugliness and sometimes toxic waste that continues in, in the particular communities in which those, that wealth and, and, and those fossil fuels have been extracted. I'm thinking now of North Dakota. A few, years, a few years ago, we had the North Dakota miracle. They found gas and oil out there. 
and then um, and they pumped it all out. And now what you find is great ugliness on the land, oil derricks that are not being used. Uh, the companies declared bankruptcy, and then, and then they left. And so they took with them their prosperity, and they left behind great ugliness for the people in North Dakota to somehow have to deal with. Um, and so we find that when we live as if we are out of relationship with the earth, um, we create ultimately great poverty. We must live it, this holy communion, this relatedness to, to each other and to this world, um, to the water that we drink, to the air that we breathe. God has brought all of these things into reality to be with us this holy communion, this redemptive communion. And so let's pledge today, before the new year begins, um, kind of a, uh, a new year's resolution, if I can suggest that. This new year's resolution resolution to live more deeply into this holy communion with God's holy, forgiving, healing, reconciling reality. Live that out every day. And at the close of each day, say, how did I do with my relationship and my relatedness um, to my brothers and sisters um, throughout my community, throughout my country, throughout my world? How was I it? able in some respect in my own best way to bring people together? How did I live out this reality to become one part of God's reconciling loving touch um, to, to the earth and the environment uh, where I live and move and have my being? Um, how did I do? So in the morning sensing the invitation and in the evening maybe uh, reviewing patiently and, and prayerfully how we did Know, how we were able to, to accomplish all that, to live more fully into God's reality and God's holy communion. Amen.